the majesty and might of London, cradle of the culture which unites the English-speaking world. The gentle countryside of the land Shakespeare called this blessed isle. The storybook cottages. The villages carved from the past which dot and dignify the landscape. The warmth and richness of country life with its strong traditional flavor, its sense of continuity, its quiet, enduring values. The variety of British life. The sounds, the sights, the color, the excitement. This is the Great Britain that lies waiting for you to discover and to enjoy during your tour of service here. The special magic that Britain casts and always has on civilized men is yours to experience. You will feel the pull of British history for its marks and its monuments are all around you. And pageantry rooted in the past is carried forward and laced into the routine life of the present. The pomp and the ceremony. The stately institutions. All are part of an epic tale which for a thousand years has been Great Britain's story. A history which has paced the progress of Western man. A history rich in beauty and grandeur. Crowded with spectacle and martial glory. And with the dreams of mighty kings. But history is above all the story of people, their character, their spirit. The English have exerted a force on a modern world stronger, perhaps, than that of any other group. And yet they live, and always have, on an island barely the size of Minnesota. Indeed, it is this fact which, in part, accounts for the direction in which their history moved. For the English people, locked in by the sea, turned to the sea for new markets, for new lands to find wealth, and in the doing, to carry civilization around the globe. Britain's navies and her merchant fleets became the wonder of the world. And from their power, and in the wake of their paths, grew an empire on which it once was said, the sun could never set. Men such as Lord Nelson, whose life stories are linked with the sea and the spreading of the empire, are among the most illustrious names in Britain's long line of heroes. Today's Britain is a product of that history, but the history itself has changed its course. New states have been created out of England's far-flung possessions. The empire is no more. swept away with the tides of the time. And the world is a far different one for all of us. Today, Great Britain is united with the US and other free nations of the West in an alliance to preserve peace in the world by blocking communist aggression. And to that end, to ensure free world strength and readiness, she permits us, as her partner, to maintain and operate a number of United States bases on British soil. And this, of course, is why you, watching this film, are in Great Britain today. 
Now, in order for you to do your job to the best of your ability, and in the process to reflect creditably upon your country and enjoy your time, it is important that you get along here. And that's what this film is all about, to help in your introduction to British life. There are no special magic rules for getting along here or anywhere else. The rules of common sense are what apply. Well, first of all, it seems reasonable wherever you are to look for similarities. And in Great Britain, there are many. More perhaps than any other country, England is like the United States in basic attitudes and beliefs. You will find this similarity everywhere, beginning with the strong religious tradition which underpins her national life, and the freedom of religion evidenced in the houses of worship of all faiths. The similarities between our political systems are evident in the regard they show American leaders whose ideas have leaped across oceans. You may also see a certain similarity, at least on the surface, between the famous pub and the corner bar in the cities of America. The pub, which is practically an institution in Britain, is something like the stateside corner bar, only more so. It's more like a friendly club, a neighborhood gathering place, where men can meet to share the quiet pleasures of a glass of beer and conversation, where nothing is hurried, a little world all its own. Chances are you'll enjoy it. But uh, in full fairness, let it be said that in spite of all the similarities, there are differences between the British and us there are bound to be. Differences, you know, don't imply either superiority or inferiority. They're just separate ways of doing things. You'll become aware of them and perhaps be disturbed at first by some of them. I think these British are kind of hard to get to know. Well, it seems so at first, until you've been here a while. Maybe they are a bit more reserved than we are, but there's a reason for it. After all, there's 50 million people on this little island. That's enough to make anyone respect privacy, his own and everyone else's. That's about it, Sergeant. But you'll find that the British respond to friendliness in much the same way we do. I think I'll ask these guys if I can play darts. In their quest for privacy, the British make the very most of it they can. The garden is the Englishman's traditional refuge, and practically every Englishman has one, which he tends with pride and care. Behind the mansions of the rich and the cottages of the modest alike bloom lovely oases in which life is all discipline and color, and a man can live, at least for a while, out of the crowded day, close to the nature he reveres. His home is his castle, however grand or however modest it may be. And here, as in his garden, he creates a sense of order, the respect for tradition and continuity, for values which have endured for generations, for family ties, and the belief in the home as the central unit of civilization is a major influence in British life. You may find yourself a guest in such a home, and when you do, you should treat the occasion with the dignity it deserves, for an invitation to a man's castle is not lightly given. But even here, as you relax in the strong similarities you are finding between British life and your own, you will be reminded of differences, small but inevitable. Where's your home, Bill? Well, I grew up in Cambridge, sir. Did you really? I grew up in Cambridge, too. You did? You mean you've lived in the States? Oh, no. Father means our own Cambridge. We have one here, too. 
may be a bit older than yours. Would you like anything more? More tea, Bill? No, thanks. I'm fine. Can I help you now, Mother? Not just now, thank you, dear. I'll let you know. I'd be glad to help with the beating if I can. With the beating? No, thank you. I can manage. I used to do it all the time for my mother before we got the electric mixer. Electric mixer? Yes. It makes it much easier. Does it indeed? Father thinks that if he ever went to America, he would see one vast gadget factory. Electric beaters. I wonder what they do to the food. The traditional British reluctance to acquire gadgets and mass-produced items is not as strong as it once was. You may still encounter it occasionally, however, but don't let it mislead you. British ingenuity has long pioneered in some of the basic industries. Britain, remember, set the pace in jet aviation, radar, television. British workmanship has produced and is still producing some of the finest manufactured items in the world. But let's get back to the subject of differences, for they obviously will intrigue you most of all at first. Take money. Now, we'll make no bones about it. The British currency system is a nightmare for the American. The basic unit is the pound, the equivalent of $2.80. Every pound is divided into 20 shillings, worth about 14 cents apiece. Half a shilling is a sixpence. Then there is a two shilling piece, and a half crown, which is worth two and a half shillings. A threepence is half a sixpence. There are 12 pence, or pennies, to every shilling, and half a penny is called a halfpenny. And half a pound is a 10 shilling note. Uh, prices are also given in terms of guineas, a coin which doesn't even exist, but which is worth 21 shillings. All clear? Good. Next subject. Language. We share a common language with the British, but there may be times when you don't believe it. I beg your pardon, sir. Could you tell me if there's a hardware store in the neighborhood? An hardware store, sir? Oh, you mean the ironmongers? I do. I want to buy a garbage can. <laughs> a garbage can, sir? Now, I think you'll find it's a dustbin you're after. Well, sir, you, um, you keep to the near side down to the bottom of the footpath, right round the roundabout, and then it's just past the bull. You can't miss it, sir. But differences, you know, can be exaggerated out of all proportion. Consider the British teapot, poor overworked symbol of misconception, and an appropriate illustration of how exaggeration can distort reality. And the simple truth is that the British like tea, most of them, and they down a fair amount of it each day. But to repeat, differences can be exaggerated out of all proportion. There's nothing in the British approach to tea drinking to justify the wild exaggerations prevalent in so much American folklore. You know the picture. People chattering like squirrels while they swill and nibble in a ceremonial ritual as stylized as the tango. It'd be a shame not to meet them. They're such enjoyable figments of the imagination. But they don't exist, whatever you may have thought. And the part of England they represent is on the far side of the moon. 
Misconception, growing out of unfamiliarity, is, of course, a two-way street. You may not have thought of it that way, but uh, listen. Know any Yanks? Yes, one or two. Like them? Well, <clears throat> yes, rather. Nice enough chaps. Take a bit of knowing, though. Now, we may not think that we're so hard to get to know, but from the British point of view, well, permit an Englishman to sit in your seat and see how bizarre some American customs and habits might seem through his eyes, particularly in exaggerated form. And not only sights, but sounds, too. Remember, we are discussing the difficulties of understanding English as the English speak it. But consider what an Englishman might think of this conversation. Come on, Daddy, let's buzz. Cool it, man. Let's cut. That flick don't wait. No sweat, man, we'll split. Although the British are a sports-loving people, there are many things they don't understand about our games. Listen, for example, to how one English reporter describes the great American pastime of football. Men in brightly colored helmets, like the crew of a spaceship, rushed on and off the field. Play seemed to be a mixture of conjuring, sleight of hand, and human skittles, and was constantly stopped by the referees. The stoppages provided the fun. Pretty girls leapt up and down in a sort of Maori war dance to stir up the crowd, shouting, how do you like your oysters? Roar, roar, roar. Strategy is evidently based on this assumption. Nobody knows who's got the ball, so to be safe, knock down everybody in sight. The biggest pile of bodies indicates where the ball is. To soften the effect of differences that do exist and to help you adjust to life in Great Britain is a task taken on by the community relations advisor whom you will meet on the base where you're stationed. The community relations advisor, a woman, is a British civilian appointed and employed by the British government but working on the staff of the U.S. commander. A CRA, as she is called, is stationed at each of the major American bases throughout the United Kingdom. She is there for your convenience and benefit. Her job is to provide a link between U.S. personnel and the local British community in which they are based. She can and will assist you in many ways. She will find out your interests and those of your family, your particular needs, whatever special problems you might have. With this, she can help you smooth your way into the British community in which you'll be living, advise you on any difficulties you might encounter and how to surmount them. She will provide you with information on Britain, where to go, what to see, how to get there, and other items of interest that'll be useful to you during your time here. As part of their effort to make the U.S. Airmen's adjustment easier, the community relations advisors in Britain have made an informal survey of the problems which servicemen encounter most frequently. We might call them gripes. The British, however, are somewhat more restrained in their vocabulary. The shortage of suitable housing emerges as the number one problem on just about every list. And oh, the things that are said about this problem. We're joking, you know. Please bear that in mind. The situation is not anywhere near as bad as all this. But a humorous approach makes the point better, as you Americans say. And the point here is that not all the flats and houses offered are as ancient and unmanageable or as haunted as the Tower of London. Oh, this is discouraging. Can you bear any more of it? 
Oh, dear. This poor chap is having a frightful time of it, isn't he? Now, joking aside, let's look at the housing situation seriously for a moment. Britain is building feverishly to catch up with the population figures which have grown so rapidly in the last several years. And at the same time, to replace the millions of our homes that were destroyed or damaged during the war. There's a long way to go yet, but progress is being made. And we do want you to find a nice place to live in while you're here. We'll be delighted to help in any way we can. Driving on the left side of the road and the right side of the car is another thing which can confuse Americans. It all can be so bewildering to newcomers. Confusion, particularly at first, is understandable. But if you're going to drive, it is extremely important that you get to know the rules immediately and observe them every time you're in a car. Traffic safety is a very big problem here, especially among Americans who aren't used to our driving customs and regulations. It's a problem which worries your commanders and our authorities alike. He's learned his lesson. Please, learn yours an easier way. Keep to the left. And guess what another problem is? The weather. Americans don't seem to like it very much. They find it too wet, too often. It's reasonable enough that people might become annoyed by the weather. But now, really, there's not a great deal we can do about it, is there? And anyway, to tell you the truth, some of us don't care much for it either. You'll find in Great Britain, as in every free society, strong differences of opinion expressed over many things. Particularly when you go to Hyde Park, where the malcontents have full sway, you'll hear points of view ranging from crackpot to radical, or both. What we need in this country is a little more talk about peace and less talk about war that you hear all the time in these Western imperialistic countries. Let's close our eyes and our minds to all this talk about missiles and bombs and testing and talk for a while about peace. That's what we want to talk about, peace. Like in Russia, I suppose. That's right, mate. Like in Russia. You said it, I didn't. You said it. Like in Russia. You would rather be red than dead, I suppose. That happens to be my motto, mate. You hit it right there. I'd rather be red than dead. That's but my motto. pay are you in? Oh, look, get out of here, mate. I'm trying to talk to these nice comrades here about the future of their beautiful country. That's if you and the Kremlin have your way. That's right. Like me and the Kremlin. We're in it together. Like me and the Kremlin. Disagreements are not always so violent, but you will find that the Briton takes his personal point of view seriously, and he will defend it volubly. It's best to avoid getting into arguments if you can, but if your opinions are solicited in a way in which it would be rude not to give them, Weigh your statements thoughtfully, taking care not to intrude into what might be strictly a British matter. And while we're on this subject, you might be asked from time to time to explain some aspect of American life, even questions which might be considered touchy or embarrassing. But it's not likely that your questioner will intend to be rude. He probably is really interested. So the best policy is to answer all the questions you can as honestly and as frankly as you can. Despite their day-to-day -day differences, most British people by far are united in basic things, such as their respect for the crown and their fundamental, bone-deep belief in democracy. For England is, after all, the world's oldest democracy. And of all her glorious traditions, free government resting on the rights of the people is the most sacred. These beliefs are the source of the British determination to defend with vigor its way of life and resist any attack upon it. 
King John is generally credited with democracy's introduction into the modern world 750 years ago, when he signed a document which, in guaranteeing certain rights of noblemen, became the basis of the idea that the rights of the people themselves can be guaranteed by the state. He was pressured and persuaded, John was, by men who perhaps had no conception of the extent of the force they were unleashing in the world. But history cares little for that, only that the Magna Carta endured to become the touchstone of democracy as we know it today. You can see this precious document yourself if you visit the British Museum in London. See it and feel awed in the presence of an idea born centuries ago in English minds on England soil, which has had so much a hand in shaping you and your own beliefs and traditions. Oh, there is much in Britain to thrill and awe you. Great monuments of great ages past, bidding you welcome, such as the stately Westminster Abbey. And if you go inside, you can visit the Poets' Corner, where you will be reminded of the rich heritage of literature which England has given us all. Men who glimpsed some abiding truth about man and life and recorded it in words that live forever. Poets such as the immortal Shakespeare who spoke for their own time and all ages after them about the human condition. What else can you do in Britain? Well, do as the British do. Become a soccer fan. The cup finals may never quite replace the World Series in your affection, but you won't be bored. And whether you're a horse racing fan or not, you're likely to be entranced by the show put on by the bookies. Chances are, however, that you'll become a racing enthusiast. British people of all classes are, and there are many colorful tracks to accommodate them, and plenty of excitement to satisfy them. The British love sports. They have all kinds for all seasons. Take advantage of them, as many as you can. It's a great way to swing into the life of any country. If your interests are scholastic, too, you will enjoy visiting the great universities. Quiet, serene, but alive with intellectual ferment. The mind of England, as its hallowed ceremonies are its long living memory. explore the strong current of its national life that threads from the honored past to the pulsing present. You will feel the pull of its history, for its history is all around you, telling in stone and spirit the tales of a noble adventure which produced a race of kings 
and the proud and sturdy people whom you will meet in Britain today. Bring to your experience with them the qualities of fair play in which we Americans take pride. Remember that it's their land and their way of life, and we are transients passing through. Respect their rules and their customs. Look for the similarities which unite us, and the differences will diminish. The glory of Britain will open to you, and your life will be richer.